Don Francis. I was an epidemiologist with CDC. We had almost 2,000 gay men uh, that we were following uh, in these clinics uh, from east to west, north to south. And we got a call, uh, you know, Don, we've got this new disease um, in these people. There's no doubt that this virus is established in this country and will be for many, many years, if not forever. We didn't know a lot about AIDS in the early days. We knew it was some kind of suspected very early on some kind of uh, infectious disease. My name is Andre Picard. I'm a columnist and reporter at the Globe and Mail. It didn't take long with HIV to see there was a bloodborne illness. You had a disease we didn't know at that time was 100% fatal, but we knew it was 50, 60, 70 of HIV infected people, that this was a deadly bug. We knew it affected gay men principally, but very quickly we saw that it was affecting other communities, high-risk communities, uh, Haitians, drug users, hemophiliacs. Growing up with hemophilia meant a lot of time in the hospital and there was no real medicine to prevent my bleeds. And by the time the late 70s and early 80s came around, they uh, had developed a miracle drug that allowed me to inject myself with blood products that would allow me to lead a normal life. I'm Mike McCarthy. I was born a hemophiliac and I got tainted blood in 1984. true that there were warning signs, but there were also really ingrained prejudices and beliefs. People don't get these kind of things that homosexuals get. That was a common belief. So we're going to be protected. Even if it is bloodborne, they're doing something else. So how could these innocent hemophiliacs be infected? I mean, it's not possible. It must be totally something else. I sat down with the blood bankers and said, you already excluded IV drug users and the rest of them are gay men that we've associated with the cases of transfusion-associated AIDS. So you have to exclude uh, gay men from donating blood. And these doofuses in the blood system just carried on. And the thousands of people who died really without any reason are just a, a negative tribute to their dullness and lack of response. There was about 3,000 people that were infected with HIV through the blood system in Canada and over 30,000 people infected with hepatitis C in the blood system in Canada until proper screening was implemented in uh, the 90s. The manufacturers, many of which are for-profit corporations in the U.S., said, whoa, 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 let's wait. You know, we can't just go stop collecting blood. Uh, this is really something that people need. We have to wait until we have more information. Uh, the Red Cross, even though it was a non-profit corporation in Canada, took a very similar tack. We don't want to scare donors off. That was the number one fear, right? We're going to scare donors off if we talk about this mystery disease. As a young man, I became very frightened and really, really scared in terms of was this really happening to me when that medicine that was supposed to give me a, a license to live a full life was now potentially going to kill me? I went into my clinic and they did a full physical and they said, there's no test for AIDS, but we think you may have it because you took all these blood products uh, when we think the products were contaminated. Nearly 50% of the hemophilia community contracted AIDS because all of them had products that were pooled from numerous blood sources so that almost all their products were infected at a certain point. It was very much Russian roulette with very bad odds, probably not uh, one bullet in the gun, but several. Not only was it god-awful, it was deadly, it was libelous, it was stupid. 
I, to this day, do not understand why. Why would you not essentially use the same logic you do for screening donors anyway to decrease the risk of hepatitis or whatever other disease we were screening with at that time? in 1992 and I was told, hey, you didn't get AIDS, but you got hepatitis C, but don't worry. People die from hep C and more people died from hep C than HIV in the blood scandal in Canada, many more. Nobody knew anything about hepatitis C in 1992 other than it was something that took years to kill you. And at the time, you were just so grateful that you didn't get HIV because it killed everybody that I felt at least I could, my life could move forward, but I still needed to understand why I was still infected with a potentially fatal virus. There was an instance in Canada where we purchased blood from a, a prison in Arkansas because of shortages here. Very, very high rates of, of hepatitis, of HIV in that population. And again, you take that and you pool it it's almost guaranteed that those lots of blood are going to be infected. It was identified that uh, I got some tainted batches from a prison in Arkansas that uh, the government knew about and uh, decided to allow it to remain in the system. And, and me and uh, hundreds of other hemophiliacs paid the price for that. Our government, who are the regulator, understood that uh, the manufacturer in Canada we're using a blood broker in Montreal and buying plasma on the open market at the height of the AIDS crisis from the riskiest places on the planet and allowing it to be exported to Canada and to be manufactured into blood products that would be used by Canadians. The blood bankers were not change agents, and that's true in Canada and the United States and elsewhere. And the regulators were really blood bankers regulating blood bankers because why would you need regulation blood banking? These are good people trying their best. Um, and as a result, thousands of people died around the world. When the Red Cross starts screening all blood donations for the AIDS-associated virus next month, the agency says it won't be required to report a positive AIDS test because the test doesn't establish whether the donor has the disease, only if he's been exposed to it at some point. If a person has a positive test, uh, some people will immediately shrink away from that person. That's the first and most obvious thing. It is possible that it can influence their employability. It's possible it can influence their social lives. The real problem uh, in in addition to the Red Cross's attitude of, you know, wanting, really denying that this was a problem was a lack of regulation. So because it was such an iconic institution, Health Canada was supposed to oversee it, but they essentially just rubber stamped everything the Red Cross did. And that was a really large failure as well, a failure of government. Testing was uh, rarely used to the full extent that it could have been. There was a number of tests that would have eliminated a large amount of contaminated blood from the system in Canada, but it was not implemented because of cost issues and the fear that they would throw safe blood out with bad blood because there was some false positives. They didn't implement a tool that could have reduced the risk for Canadians and it uh, proved to be a fatal decision for uh, people that relied on a safe blood product or, or a transfusion. The confidence in the blood system had plummeted uh, there was a lot of pressure to get at some answers so that there could be more confidence in the blood system. It took a lot of uh, public pressure to uh, ask or demand the government to enact an inquiry. Good evening. The victims of Canada's tainted blood tragedy will have their day in court. Tonight, Ottawa and the provinces have announced a full-scale judicial inquiry into the country's blood supply in the early 1980s. It is not and it will not be a witch hunt. We hope that never again will a major national public health catastrophe unfold as this one did. 
If we do not take decisive action now, the system will continue to creak along with more patchwork solutions until the next crisis. I'm Donald Pinkston Francis. Well, I was contacted by the Creever Commission that they were going to examine um, the Canadian side of transfusion-associated AIDS. And I was more than pleased to get an airplane and come because here Canada had the good sense of appointing someone like Justice Creever who was serious to do his job, but the committee's job of seriously looking at the situation. And that was remarkable from my standpoint, coming from the south of the border. I ask again, will the government dispel the appearances of a cover-up by giving Craver all the information right. he needs to get to the bottom of the tainted blood supply. You just get. Honorable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the government has every intention of uh, assisting the Craver Commission in getting to the bottom of the events uh, surrounding the tainted blood scandal. In fact, Mr. Speaker. We started to hear that Craver was, in fact, being uh, slowed down by the federal government who did not want him to release names or lay blame in his report. And Mr. Speaker, my question, why does this government place a cabinet secrecy ahead of the national interest in health? Why does it place the political <laughs> security of liberal politicians ahead of the security of Canada's blood supply? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. First, Mr. Speaker, I categorically deny the claim of the Honourable Member, and in fact, Mr. Speaker, the former... We kept hearing the Red Cross refusing to apologize. The Red Cross was involved in and followed and indeed in top of, on top of the issue from the start. I don't see the effort here of adjusting to the AIDS epidemic at all. Difficult as the first uh, part was, I expect that the second part will be more difficult. But um, we're capable of, uh, of the task. There was a long distraction in the inquiry that went off to the courts, all the way up to the Federal Court of Canada, which ultimately ruled that, yes, a commission can lay blame. Ultimately, the kind of things that Justice Creever exposed through his exhaustive uh, inquiry, the findings were so disturbing that the federal government took him to the Supreme Court to, de to try to stop him from releasing his final report. With his report, he creverized the healthcare system in this country, and his principle was, you don't wait for the body count, you act on the principle of safety first. He made his first recommendation about the victims, about how they needed to be supported and they needed to have retribution or financial support for what had happened to them. We've done the best we can in a difficult situation. Get back to the drawing room, because this does not cut it. This is exactly what we've been hearing about for the past two weeks. The government arbitrarily decided of the, who would get help, and it would be those people that had the greatest opportunity to win a lawsuit in the court of law. When we chose the period of 86 to 90, we took the best scientific medical data that was available to us. You should be ashamed! I've explained the rationale. All of us agree that's the approach that should be taken, and that's the approach we've taken. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sick. I am dying. I got a little boy at home, and I think this is absolutely outrageous that Canadians have to be treated in this manner. I felt abandoned. 
I was before that arbitrary date of 86 to 1990. I got prison blood in 1984. Uh, that was egregious uh, misstep and bad decisions by government. I'm not sure that the victims of tainted blood could ever get justice. Uh, what was done to them was horrific. Uh, the failings were massive and multiple parties failed time and time again. So I, I don't know if there can ever be justice. As Craver in his own words said, Compensation for all victims harmed by the negligent blood system. Tainted blood victims basically took the bull by the horns and showed the Canadian public and certainly showed the Canadian politicians that sometimes when you make the wrong decision, it doesn't go away and you can't put the coffin lid on it and say that file is closed because it's only closed when there's justice for all. The principle of equal marriage really begins with the minority rights protections of the Charter of Rights. I'm Paul Martin. I was the 21st Prime Minister of Canada, and I brought in the Civil Marriage Act. Well, the MNH case was foundational to the struggle for equal marriage. My name is Douglas Elliott. I'm a gay activist, and I was the lawyer for the Metropolitan Community Church of Toronto in the same-sex marriage case. Good afternoon, my lords and ladies. My name is Douglas Elliott, and I represent the Foundation for Equal Families. Another Along comes M versus H, and a very young but a very talented young lawyer named Martha McCarthy, who was hired by M to seek spousal support from her wealthy partner, H. M was penniless. This issue is a political hotbed in which the stakes run high. The discriminatory treatment of <clears throat> gays and lesbians must be stopped, and no one apparently is going to do that but this court. Thank you. The Supreme Court of Canada, in an eight to one ruling, said that common law couples' rights and obligations had to be extended to same sex couples. That really propelled us almost to marriage. They said in the decision, we're not deciding marriage. It was a very hopeful decision that we had another building block towards marriage, but that case was fundamentally about support payments for one female spouse towards another spouse. We knew that unless and until there was an actual marriage case, 
we wouldn't get to marriage because fundamentally, marriage for same-sex couples was a political issue. Hi, I'm Mike Stark. Oh, I thought you were <laughs> supposed to. Well, no, I thought. Okay. Say. So, what, what I thought we would do is we go. I'd say I'm Mike Stark. Hi, I'm Mike Stark, and I'm Michael Leshner, better known as the Michaels. And I'm a. Re oh, let me just stop you. If I say <laughs> I'm a retired lawyer and gay, gay rights activist, it then kind of doesn't it give me a power imbalance that Mike doesn't have. Yeah. Okay. I'm a retired crown, assistant crown attorney and gay rights activist. By the time M versus H was argued, I had really gotten to know some of the key lawyer as, and activists around this issue. Uh, Martha McCarthy and I were very good friends. And it began actually in the wake of M versus H. Martha said to me, maybe we can do a marriage challenge now. We hatched the plot. Martha was going to put together a group of couples who were going to pursue civil marriage, and I was going to approach the Metropolitan Community Church of Toronto about doing religious marriage. Under the law, if they are a licensed church, they can use the publication of bans as a substitute for a license. and on behalf of Metropolitan Community Church of Toronto, we welcome you to our service this morning. We hope that you'll A lot of the opposition to same-sex marriage has been religious, so to think that you could actually use uh, religious means to have in the church a same-sex marriage, I think was, you know, pretty, pretty good on their part. But we knew that it wasn't going, you know, that wasn't going to be the end of the story. It was just kind of an interesting twist. I publish the bans of marriage between Kevin Barassa and Joe Varnell. If any of you know of any legal cause why these two persons should not be joined together in holy matrimony... We did this announcement that we were doing the bans, and we were so shocked the first day. No one objected. I'll admit I had a tear in my eye. I was so surprised. There was kind of a sharp intake of breath, and then this huge round of applause, thunderous applause. People were so happy that there was no objection. <laughs> then we got a letter from the government saying, stop, cease and desist. This is an unlawful wedding that you're planning. But they didn't say what they would do if we went ahead. So I sent them a letter saying, what we're doing is protected by the Charter of Rights. We have no intention of stopping. Stop us if you wish. Fourteenth, two 2001, a day I shall never forget, and I hope Canadians will never forget. I remember going to church that day in the morning for the church service, and there were uh, mounted police, uh, there were a lot of police, there were protesters wearing devil masks and with homophobic slogans on them. There had been a bomb threat, there had been death threats against Brent, Hawks, our pastor, he was wearing a bulletproof vest. There were, uh, the police tactical squad was uh, secreted away in the basement of the church. 
we had used high security to get the couples there that day uh, and Brent. Uh, Brent didn't think he was going to live out the day. Uh, he's admitted that since he called his family and said that he loved them and that they might not hear from him again. I've never seen anything like it. The front of the church was filled, on the right-hand side, was filled with cameras from all over the world. It was world-beating news that this marriage was taking place because if it was legal, it was going to be the first legal same-sex wedding in the world. We were all really, really conscious of the fact that this was an historical moment. Welcome all of you, and in particular, we welcome many special guests who are here with us today. And I take you to be my lawfully wedded spouse. Joe, I take you to be my lawfully wedded spouse. To grieve with you in sorrow. To grow with you in love. Throughout our lives together. Under the Vital Statistics Act, the church was required to submit the uh, marriage documents for registration with the Ontario government, and the Ontario government was required to deposit them and to make them public, and there, then issue an official Ontario marriage certificate. So um, I told Brent, I think we need to submit these documents to the Ontario government and Bob Rensman was the minister responsible at the time, and he said, I will not accept these for registration under any circumstances. And so we went to court. It was fundamentally important that our freedom would come from the court that would change the law and because uh, the law trumps parliament. We were saying, look, these people are married. The government won't recognize it. Why not? And it sort of pushed the onus back onto the government to explain. It was a long decision. We got the ruling. As I read each one, it dawned on me that the collective decision was, we won. And I looked up at Kevin and Joe and Brent, and I was shaking, and I said, we won, we won. And they were ecstatic. Everyone was ecstatic. One of the three justices said we could marry right away. Two of the others said, no, we're going to give Parliament two years to change the law. So that's a pretty resounding victory. So we took the opportunity, um, and Michael proposed to me. <laughs> publicly. That, publicly. We didn't do anything in those days that wasn't uh, public. But, you know, what I thought was very important at that moment, and I guess it crystallized in the public's mind, is here was a court decision, here were two men who had been together since 81 who couldn't marry, where one of them turns to the other and says, will you marry me? And <laughs> Mike said, of course I'll marry you. <laughs> We knew that there was going to be an appeal. To our surprise, the Ontario government decided not to appeal. Only the Canadian government appealed. So off we went to the Court of Appeal. They were very interested in all the arguments about, was there an alternative to marriage? 
did Parliament have another option? And of course, our team argued that there was no other option, that only marriage is marriage. That's what excluding us from marriage is all about. It's about designating us as inferior human beings. That's why they want to try and give us something else. You might as well put the pink triangle on us again like the Nazis did. They gave us, I think, four or five days advance notice that the decision was coming down. So then Michael kicked into gear. We were given a date and Michael and I went out, bought new suits, got rings. We were going to, if the decision was favorable, marry that day. And of course, on June the 10th of 2003, we got the decision. Decision day, June 10th. So Michael and I grab our suits and our little suit bags, hop on the Bay Street bus, and take the, the bus down to City Hall, and that's where we pick up the decision. And we won. And then I start singing. Um, well, no, first, first you opened it. Well, opened it, realized what had happened. You go right and, to the end. And I start singing um, the song from oh, we're My, Fair, yeah. My Fair Lady, We're Getting Married in the Morning. <laughs> we all march out, and I'm singing this, and the press knows what's happening, and they're everywhere. It was a unanimous decision. They all completely agreed, as opposed to the divisional court. To our great surprise, they said, effective immediately. With this ring, I join my love with yours in marriage. <laughs> Yeah, it was an amazing euphoric yeah. day. And it was like, here we are getting married a in front lawyers. of- A few lawyers. Yeah, but we're getting married really Clean in front of- ladies. Getting married in front of the press. I mean, you've got like, you, you can't even imagine like all the cameras set up. And... I love the fact that the cleaning ladies who I had known for years were there and they were clapping. And it, it, it's so primal an issue you realize marriage is something that everyone understands from whatever culture, from whatever part of the world. And they would look at us and they just saw two happy people. It wasn't a local story. It wasn't a provincial story. It wasn't a national story. It was a world story. At the end, Shankar Chess said, well, the courts have spoken. We're liberals. We have to go by the charter. We're not going to appeal. Then we get a change in leadership. Then Martin took over as prime minister, and Kotler became the attorney general. In terms of equal marriage, uh, the courts were all over the place. There were courts deciding uh, that equal marriage was on, and there were other courts where they were deciding uh, the exact opposite. But after a period of time, one court, that is to say Ontario having, deci having decided in favor, then you had both Ontario and Quebec supporting uh, equal marriage. And, and that, was a that, was, that, was, that was very important. And it was at that point uh, that the government then said, it was going to make a reference to the Supreme Court of Canada in order to determine that same-sex marriage was in fact constitutional. God's way is clear. Marriage is for one man and for one woman. This was a huge social debate while this was going on. Everywhere you went, everybody was talking about it. Everyone. Each of us is here today because we believe that all love is equal. 
and all love is worthy of respect and recognition. The government fundamentally, uh, if it was going to go forth, did not want the question of constitutionality to be raised as an objection, and therefore went to, to the Supreme Court, uh, made a reference to the Supreme Court on that issue. They went uh, to the Supreme Court of Canada to ask questions that they wanted the Supreme Court to answer, that everyone knew what the, an the answers would be in advance, but it bought them time. The Attorney General of Canada is attempting to get a decision which he calls an advisory opinion, which he will then use as a kind of a battering ram against members of parliament. It is a political move. It's a, an attempt by the government to not rely on its own lawyers, but to get the nine greatest minds in the country to say that this is legally valid. So it is political cover for the government in a way. It will be ultimately up to Parliament to pass that bill or not. This is simply to provide advice to the Government of Canada about what is required by the Charter of Rights to protect the equality of gays and lesbians and what is required to protect religious freedom. They think their legislation is valid. They just want to make sure. They want some guidance from the court. I think that's entirely appropriate. It was the most strange and amazing hearing I've ever been at. The Supreme Court of Canada was packed. They turned the lobby into a media studio. I've never seen that before. Dozens and dozens of parties were allowed into to participate in the hearing. We're counting on our parliamentarians to defend the real nature of marriage, which is the union of one man and one woman, who are the only people who can actually bring forth children, the basis of our society today in Canada. This is a human rights issue. This is a civil rights issue. The definition of marriage is changed and constitutionalized as to include same-sex marriage. It will be open season on religious institutions. They were not buying the arguments that were being made against the bill by the huge number of religious opponents who again were saying it was the end of civilization and God was going to rain down brimstone on Ottawa like Sodom and Gomorrah and it was the end of everything. My heart goes out to those who have to sit and listen to their rights being called into question again after they've been so definitively dealt with at the Court of Appeal. And of course, we won. The court was unanimous. Today, the Supreme Court of Canada has recognized that equal civil marriage for gays and lesbians is a right that flows from the Charter. We had the right to say that the marriages performed on January 14th, 2001 were the first legal same-sex marriages in the world. I think by allowing same-sex marriage, it's an acknowledgement that your relationships are just as valid and require the same rights and responsibilities as anyone else's. So it really, you know, we can talk about all these different things, but it really just comes down to basic equality. Once the Supreme Court of Canada had spoken, the government was in a position to act. Mr. Martin, a salle ma for Mr. Kotler, seconded by Ms. McClellan, moves that Bill C-38, an act respecting certain aspects of legal capacity for marriages and promises, be now read a second time and referred to a legislative committee. So Mr. Martin then introduced the Civil Marriage Act, and it was a very stirring 
moment in Canadian parliamentary history. And I dare say that the Prime Minister's speech was the finest one that he's ever given. It was from the heart and it was powerful. Our deliberations will not be merely about a piece of legislation or sections of legal text. More deeply, they will be about the kind of nation we are today and the nation we want to be. This bill protects what already... The Supreme Court ruled that, in fact, equal marriage would be constitutional. And I had decided, given the length of time that it really elapsed under this, that the time had come to act. And I brought in the Equal Marriage Act, and it passed, and the rest is history. Same-sex marriages are real marriages. They're not pretend marriages. They're real marriages. I am very proud of the Civil Marriage Act. I'm very proud of it for the reasons which I have stated. But it is not my legacy. It's Pierre Trudeau's legacy, because he brought in the Charter of Rights. And I'll tell you who else's legacy it is. It is the countless number of men and women over the course of the last 30 or 40 years have not been afraid to come out of the closet and say, this is who I am, this is what I'm about. The public would say, oh, you're so courageous, you're so this or that. And I think the public realized there, the only self-interest we had was that we loved each other, wanted to marry and live our lives as best we could. We also wanted to make this world a better place for people coming up. Even to this day, 14 years later, we still have people who will stop and say, are you the Michael? And they'll say, thank you. The people of Canada have worked hard to build a country that opens its doors to include all, regardless of their differences. If we do not step forward, then we will step back. And if we do not protect a right, then we deny it. Together as a nation, Together as Canadians, let us step forward. There's a, an evolutionary development of political parties and there's periodic periods when they have to change from what they were in order to address the current problems or to have a future. My name is Preston Manning and I was involved as a founder of the Reform Party of Canada, the Canadian Alliance. the makings of a full-blown Western separatist movement at the time in the 1980s. After considerable discussion, it was decided why not create a new uh, principal federal party you know, based in uh, Western Canada. Preston was really committed to grassroots democracy and he really believed in following the lead of your constituents. My name's Rick Salutin, I'm a freelance writer. 
there was a kind of a reaction against what was seen as the kind of soft, cosmopolitan, Eastern-centered conservatism of the PCs. The West was increasingly alienated from both the traditional parties. The Reform Party was really brought into being to advance these reforms, particularly on behalf of Western Canadians. And now with your decision... I think a reform is that kind of relief well. And if it hadn't have been drilled, you might have had a full-blown uh, separatist movement in the West at the same time that you had a separatist movement in Quebec, and that, that could have torn the country apart. My view is, is that you change the party from within. I'm Peter McKay, uh, former member of parliament for Picto and Ganesh Geisbro. Uh, I was elected uh, leader of the Progressive Conservative Party in 2003. Like a marriage, you don't divorce yourself or, or break away uh, when these tensions arise or when there is a necessity to compromise and, and work it out. And when you're divided, as the old saying goes, a, a house divided against itself uh, cannot stand. Good is a constitutional accord promising peace, order, and good government. By taking apart the old, old Progressive Conservative Party, that you had this vote splitting phenomenon. It was a 1997 election, and, and we got a few more seats, became the official opposition, but the vote splitting was still a problem. So now you've had vote splitting in 1993 that handed things over to the Liberals, had vote splitting in 1997 that handed it over to. In the election of 2000, we found ourselves, uh, again, uh, coming out much short of where we wanted to be. The party just barely maintained status within the House of Commons, and uh, Mr. Clark made the decision to leave. After the decision of Joe Clark to step down, there were a few of us in the caucus who made the decision to run. I'm here today to uh, put forward my name as a candidate in the Progressive Conservative Party leadership race. We raised a question with the reform membership, and it was very important that this be done incrementally. We didn't say, let's go and join the PCs. We said, let's can we set up a committee to investigate if there's some common ground between ourselves and some of these other conservative-oriented uh, people? The alliance was another step in the uh, process. Preston Manning has now been ousted. Stockwell Day is the leader. They're having a leadership crisis, which results ultimately in Stephen Harper becoming leader of the Alliance. And our leader is Mr. Stephen Harper. The Canadian Alliance is strong and that the Canadian Alliance is here to stay. He has indicated in the past that, uh, that unity was something that he was interested in. It's what has to happen if, uh, if we're going to end vote splitting, if we're going to be able to ever challenge the governing Liberals. Of the Progressive Conservative Party Leadership Convention from the Central. The convention did have a kind of schizophrenic quality. I'm a sucker for anything that even remotely resembles genuine democratic activity. And so I like those kind of ragged conventions where stuff happens that you didn't know. I went there to win. 
I, I didn't go there to, to forfeit what I felt was an, an important contribution that I wanted to make to public life. I wanted to lead the party. Going into the convention, it was clear that um, nobody was going to sweep the other side away. You weren't going to have a big first battle of victory. So there was going to be some horse trading. There was also this huge elephant in the room around we, we're still split. We're still a divided conservative movement. Are we going to try to reconcile this or are we going to go it alone? Combining with the alliance or with the reform people was not a major theme at that party. They thought they were going to keep it uh, together with themselves. So as we got the second ballot results, uh, you see Scott Bryson that uh, pulled 18.1% of voter support, and he was eliminated because he finished fourth in the ballot. Went immediately back up into the stands, back into a corner, was surrounded by his people, uh, including former cabinet minister Bernard McDougall, where they spent that 40 minutes in conversation. And then he took some cell phone calls. We understand that one of them was a Peter McKay, the other one was a Jim Prentice. There was a lot of speculation about which direction he was going to go, and of course, when you're trying to track that. They did the usual back and forth. I think Scott Bryson uh, went over to Jim Prentice, who I think had led on the first ballot. And, uh, well, it's not going according to the plan that a lot of people had predicted for this convention. We are headed to a third ballot, and it is now a contest between Peter McKay as the front runner, uh, David Orcher, who uh, held his own in second place again, and now Jim Prentice, the question being, how many supporters can Scott Bryson deliver uh, to Jim Prentice? And that's what he has been, had been busy doing. I've been talking with the Orchard people for several days. Uh, you know, I've been speaking with them. Bryson has brought enough people to Prentice to put him ahead of Orchard. Orchard's the bottom man. Peter McKay, 1,128 votes. <laughs> David Orchard. 617 votes. 617 votes. Jim Prentice. 761 votes. This brought us to a bit of a showdown at the end where it was either going to be Jim Prentice or myself reaching out to David Orchard, who had brought a significant number of delegates. I mean, he was second throughout the voting. And while he had no room for growth, uh, he was ultimately cast in the role of kingmaker. Okay, here comes Peter McKay is coming down. We'll listen in here. Okay. Where are we moving to, Peter? They're clearing a path between David Orchard and Peter McKay. I can see them both. Here okay. they go. Now let's hear what they say. Well, there's the. There's Jim Prentice, and I think Jim Prentice has just realized that. Well, it's it's very good. We're walking out of here together. All right. Well, there it is. That seals it. David Orchard has joined. I wound up in a negotiation with David Orchard. David Orchard was similarly negotiating with Jim Prentice, who was now backed by Scott Bryson. How do I know that? While I was speaking to David Orchard, his phone rang, and it was Scott Bryson calling on behalf of Jim Prentice, offering him a deal. That deal was identical to the discussion that we were having. Is this surprising that he would throw his support to McKay? I would think it's a surprise, yes. Peter, I guess, went up, or David went up and had a chat they were in these bleachers that they had, and they made um, some kind of a deal. And uh, David announced he was taking his people over to Peter on the basis of a signed agreement. Well, it's, uh, it's going to be a very interesting end to the convention, so. And you just we, see the bewildered look on Orchard delegates' faces when they get told uh, he went to McKay. It's incredible. People are still asking, has he really gone down? They, they want confirmation. They really want absolute confirmation. Listen, I'm, I'm here because of David. I wouldn't be a member if it weren't for David. And as a result, 
I'm, I'm going to follow David. Okay. We need to trust that our leader, who we know to be very reflective and intelligent, we believe uh, that he can make David's a decision. What did you promise? David and I have discussed how we're going to move this party forward. Uh, we have an understanding here that's going to be, in my view, good for the country and good for the party. We've agreed that we will not, the 301 rule in our party will be honored and there will be no merger uh, with the Canadian Alliance. I won the convention with over 65% of the delegate support. It's just a pretty strong majority in a convention with that many candidates. But it was seen by many and cast by the media and the pundits as a poison pill. What an incredible exercise in democracy this has been today. The signed agreement that he made had at least two components. One was a review, a serious review of free trade. The other was a solemn promise from Peter McKay that the PCs, the conserv his conservatives, would never, uh, at least in the foreseeable parliamentary term, merge with the right-wing alliance. For as I've said many times, when our party is divided, we lose. Conservatives are united, the country wins. What about that impression that a lot of delegates have that you sold out, you made a deal with the devil just to win? Well, those are inflammatory words. I don't see that at all. I mean, and what does it say about um, the issue of working with the Alliance? What kind of uh, promise did you make on that? Uh, there would be no formal merger of parties. This was described as the deal with the devil. It was Faustian. It was epic, the betrayal of the membership by me to have locked arms and won the leadership. And I don't want to sound defensive about this, but every leadership in every party in the history of Canada happened because of a deal. There sure were a lot of questions about the deal with David Orchard. So is it David Orchard uh, Devil or David Orchard King? We're not going to join the Canadian Alliance. We're not going to merge. We're not going to have You joint. just heard Mr. McKay well, said he's not, a, he's not against pursuing discussions and talks with the Alliance. He's, he's going to talk with all, everybody. That's not he's, language he's, you use. He said he's going to talk with all parties, and that's, that's wonderful. What we've said is there will be no merger, no joint candidates with the Canadian Alliance. I was later savaged as the only one that would have signed an agreement with David Orchard, and I just took it rather than said, well, hold on a minute. These other guys were similarly prepared to sign anything and more. And that's all I'm going to say about it. Who called first? Mr. Prentice's people called first. They called you first, and you said to them, I will come. Did you say I'll come to you on these terms? I said, this is what I want. I told them right out front, this is what I'm putting out to, to everybody. The same arrangement. And Mr. Prentice said no. No. Well, he didn't say no, but he quibbled. What did he quibble over? The deal was released. It was written down. That's what made it completely unusual. It, it was transparent. It was presented to the, to the members and later voted upon by the members. I, I, I mean, politically, I was severely wounded coming out of that convention in such a way that, you know, ultimately my ability to, to lead the party was, was diminished. I ran into Stephen Harper in the lobby of the House of Commons, and I simply said, sort of as an offhand comment, we should talk sometime. Before I begin, let me just say it's a historic and I think very uh, exciting day. Late last night, Mr. McKay and I signed an agreement in principle to create a new political party, the Conservative Party of Canada. Mr. McKay, on the, uh, the question of David Orchard and, uh, and the merger negotiations that you had with him, is this the creation of a new party? Is that how you're going to get around the, uh, the David Orchard opposition? I'm not trying to get around um, anything. I, uh, I've kept my commitments to Mr. Orchard. I spoke to him this morning. 
I told him it was a complete and utter betrayal of our agreement, but more importantly, that it was a betrayal of the PC Party of Canada, its constitution, and its history. It's incomprehensible to me that a new leader would campaign in a leadership race across the country, pledging that he was not the merger candidate in front of forums across Canada, then obtain the leadership on the basis of a written document pledging not to merge the PC party and to respect its constitution, and within days after winning the leadership, set him train the process to dissolve the, the Progressive Conservative Party. I naively felt that it would be unthinkable for Peter McKay to sign this agreement and in less than a year just act as if it didn't exist. Um, I thought I knew what politics was like, but I, that seemed to me beyond the pale. I need for people to understand that this betrayal, as it was portrayed, of David Orchard was the decision of the party in the most democratic, inclusive way that I could possibly present it. Ninety percent endorsed the idea of merging. For we are joining today as equals with the Canadian Alliance this is what conservatives from across Canada wanted us to do. I fairly quickly came to the conclusion that, you know, I, I had a lot of baggage uh, and had accumulated it in a, in a very short time that would have hurt the party. So I made the decision not to run for the leadership of the new conservative party. Uh, there were other contestants and ultimately we know history uh, Stephen Harper won that contest. Stephen Harper. Stephen Harper. 15,614.7. We will provide this country with a direction for the future. Merci beaucoup. Thank you all. God bless Canada. I am not surprised that McKay reneged and that, that he lied and then just went back on it. I'm a little surprised at how bland he was about it. On his superficial level, he may have thought he was doing the right thing. What I find odd is that it didn't bother him a bit to uh, reverse himself on a solemn, signed promise publicly. That says something about um, uh, something about something that I don't quite understand. This wasn't about me at that point, uh, certainly not. Uh, the importance of a competitive democracy, the importance of party unity and uh, the vibrant conservative movement that I knew could and should exist in Canada was far bigger than any one individual. Thank you, merci beaucoup. Tonight, friends, our great country has voted for change. A small group of people in this country can still take the basic tools that democracy gives to everybody, freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom to try to persuade you to do this instead of that or vote this way instead of that, and can change the system. The new West is built on the principle of freedom of enterprise, fiscal responsibility, compassion for the young, the old, the sick and the poor, equality of citizens and provinces, and democracy that reflects the common sense of the common people. That's right. The New West... That's right. gave us a that. Um, I think if we lost leadership conventions and went to something else, there would be a gap. I'm talking about the old-fashioned kind where they got together and horse traded and, you know, wore stupid hats and people crossed the floor back and forth. You'd lose something. If people say, what do you want written on your political tombstone, I would say I'd put the country first.
We were aware that we were aiding and abetting. We all knew that, or sensed, it was probably illegal in Canada to have an assisted death. But it was absolutely not a concern at all. It was all about, she needed this, she wanted this, I'll help her do this. I'm Lee Carter. And I'm Price Carter, or Kay Carter's daughter and son. She had been ill with spinal stenosis for a couple of years, and it got where she was really debilitated. She said to me, I want to ask you if you would take me overseas so that I could die with dignity. She had, wore diapers. Um, it was just an existence that she uh, said, I just, I do, I've had a full life, she said, and I'm ready to go. She was aware that what we were doing was illegal. And that's why for the six months that I worked on this, it was a very hush-hush and we couldn't, and that was really a shame because we couldn't tell people and couldn't share with outside of our family. Palliative care can take care of most things, but it can't give you control. And that, in fact, is what the story of Sue Rodriguez is all about. Sue Rodriguez did have palliative care, and it was good palliative care. My name is Sandra Martin, and I'm the author of A Good Death. If I cannot give consent to my own death, whose body is this? Who owns my life? Back in the early 90s, when Sue Rodriguez was about 40, was suffering from ALS, nobody was publicly asking for the right to die. I mean, there were some doctors who were helping patients along, but it was the doctor's decision. It wasn't the patient's choice. And I think that that's a key issue in this story. somehow, some way, I'll deal with my future as it comes along. Sue Rodriguez wanted to control her life and her death. And the problem for Sue Rodriguez was that she could die before she wanted to die, if she was willing to die by her own hand. But if she was going to wait until life was no longer tolerable for her, she was going to be so disabled, she wasn't going to be able to kill herself. She was going to need help. And that's why she went to the Supreme Court of Canada to ask for a medically assisted death. You should have the right to control what happens to your body in the final stages of your life. Are you not opening the door very wide to abuse, not out of bad faith, but abuse by people who want to do good? Surely the state should not have the right to impinge upon the terminal stages of a mentally competent but physically handicapped person's life, denying them the option of maintaining dignity when an able-bodied patient is able to make that choice. Thank you very much, my lords, my ladies. Thank you, Mr. Considine. Rodriguez was a product of his time, and so was Carter. And the time was different uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. My name is Joseph Arve. I was lead counsel in the case of Carter versus Canada, which is the case dealing with physician-assisted dying. The decision in Rodriguez was to uphold the constitutional validity of the section of the criminal code that made it a crime for anyone to assist someone with 
his or her death. I think the Supreme Court of Canada at that time might have thought that it would have been going much further than a court should go. I was aware we were aiding and abetting, but it didn't influence my work in getting her there. You make an application to Dignitas, and then when they take you, they call it the green light. And the day that we got the green light, I phoned her and said, Katie, we've got the green light. It meant Yes, we can go to Switzerland. And then we were able to start to make airplane reservations and plans and how are we going to do this and how are we going to get her out of the care facility. A departure out of Vancouver was really an experience because all of her, her grandchildren and um, my sisters and brothers were at the airport saying goodbye to her. They're crying, they're sad. This is the last time they're gonna see grandma. We kind of parted from them on our way down to the gate and, and, and my mom said to Hollis, my husband, I want this to be fun. I want us, I want this to be a lark. I want us to have fun on this journey. Erica and Horst, a husband and wife team, were there. Erica kneels down, puts her hands on her lap, and she says, Kate, I'm so glad to meet you. I'm just so glad to meet you. And Kate, I'm so glad to meet you too. She was asked countless times, Kate, are you sure this is what you want to do? You realize that this, if you just do this and you do it, you will be dead. And her constant refrain was, I, Kay Carter, wish to die with dignity. She said, I've come halfway around the world. Let's get started. If I was a director, I could not have scripted this whole process any better. Uh, Erica leans down and she puts her hands on her knees and she says, Kay, when you drink this, you will die. Are you sure this is what you want to do? And she says, I, Kay Carter, Wish to die with dignity. <laughs> okay. All right then. And uh, what did she say? What did What did Erica say? Uh, um, I'll meet you on the other side. I'll meet you on the other side. Wait for me. I'll meet you yeah. on the other side. So um, she has the pentobarbital. Mom takes it. She drinks it. She fell asleep. She, she fell just, asleep. She fell asleep in our arms. We're just, Mom. We love you so much, and it's we've our life has been great. Thank you, and more stories, more talking to her, and. After about 15 minutes, and she's lying in the bed, and her arms are sort of like this around her, horse came over and just touched like this. I think she's gone. I think she's gone. And then, in a piece of, of beautiful symmetry, Erica opens the doors, and the curtains billow Those out. French doors on the oh. other side of the room, and they, had, they were draped with these big white drapes. And mm. so it was, she walked across the room, and she opened these French doors and the drapes flew out the window. And she said, let her spirit fly. I was approached by BC Civil Liberties and um, they asked my husband and I if we would talk to them about being plaintiffs in this case. And both of us went, of course we will. Why would we do that? Oh, it's just continuing what she had always wanted, that Canadians should have a choice in how they die. I believe that public opinion has shifted, um, that there was now a groundswell of support 
for physician assisted dying that didn't exist back in 1992 or 4 whenever Rodriguez was decided. It became apparent that many people had to choose between committing suicide or asking family or friends to assist them with their death when they still were enjoying their life. Because if they waited too long to the point where life no longer had any value for them or living was worse than death, then it would be too late. So they were being denied their own lives, the freedom to live their own lives as long as they wanted. And that was a very persuasive argument. We were able to establish that this law actually contributed to death. This law not only deprived people of their liberty and security of the person, but to deprive them of their life. The BC Supreme Court decision, the trial of decision, came down on June 15th, 2012. So we were locked in a room for two hours reading this massive decision. It was like 400 pages long. And needless to say, um, we were ecstatic with the outcome. We knew this was just uh, step one in a three-step dance. We knew that the government would appeal to the Court of Appeal. We were obviously disappointed in the decision of the BC Court of Appeal. When we started this case, we knew that um, it wasn't going to be over until we got to the Supreme Court of Canada. Carter et al. versus Attorney General of Canada. Lee Carter et al. versus Attorney General of Canada et al. Again. There was a huge sea change between Rodriguez in the early 90s and Carter in, uh, you know, 20 years later. This is a momentous occasion. This case quite simply concerns matters of life and death. It may require the court even to other things were happening around the world. The Netherlands passed its euthanasia law in 2002. Oregon passed its form of assisted dying in 94, but it really came into being in 97. There was a movement in Quebec that was doctor-led. You know, where physician-assisted dying came into play was societies that were tolerant, societies that were progressive. We say that the present law that makes it a crime for such persons irrespective of their circumstances, to seek the assistance of a physician to hasten their death is unconstitutional. And we also say that the law that denies those who are so physically disabled that they are unable to end their lives without assistance, as can any able-bodied person, violates the equality rights of the Charter. The Supreme Court of Canada has ruled in favour of doctor-assisted suicide for Canadians who are mentally competent, but suffering what it termed irremediable illness. In a unanimous decision today, the judges ruled the criminal code provisions of the There was extensive reaction to today's Supreme Court ruling. The Supreme Court of Canada confirmed that seriously and incurably ill Canadians have the constitutional right to choose physician assistance in dying. This is a momentous day, a historic day, a day that I think we as Canadians can celebrate. We now have... Now we know we won. It was over, and we had accomplished what we set out to accomplish. And we are absolutely overjoyed by the court's ruling today. This is a tremendous victory for human rights and for compassion at the end of life. What this decision That's the only time I've ever seen all the lawyers weeping they were so overjoyed. They came in the room, there was tears streaming down their eyes, and Josh said, we won. 
We want everything. It was unanimous. We're standing today in memory of Gloria Taylor. We're standing today in memory of Kay Carter. Today, with the help of BC Civil Liberties Association, her journey is complete with the Supreme Court of Canada decision granting Canadians the rights that she was denied. Very disappointed in today's ruling. We find that this decision is the most destructive and least restrictive uh, option in the world right now. I fear a free for all. I fear I fear that it will eventually devolve into pressure for disabled people to end their lives if they're not already there. The Supreme Court of Canada indicated that any law should allow an adult who is competent, who voluntarily seeks the assistance of a physician in dying, should have that right so long as that person has a grievous and irremediable illness. Full stop. The court uh, allowed uh, Parliament and the provincial legislatures 12 months to enact new legislation. We intend to take the time to thoughtfully review this very important decision. Uh, there is a, a wide and uh, obviously very emotional range of perspectives on this issue. disbelief if we adopt this so-called solution to suffering. The bill has been introduced because of a specific requirement of the government to respond to a decision of the Supreme Court. who is eligible to a narrower class of suffering people than the class who won a unanimous decision in the Supreme Court of Canada in Carter. It doesn't comply with the Carter case and it doesn't comply with the Charter. The emphasis had switched from what the Supreme Court was saying, which was about suffering, suffering that is intolerable to the patient, suffering that is grievous and irremediable. It had changed from that to a reasonably foreseeable natural death. Not more than one further sitting day shall be allotted to the consideration of the report stage. Free and open debate on matters of moral conscience as they relate to end of life ethical matters is being curtailed. There's nothing in the Carter decision uh, that talks about uh, proximity to death. With great respect, Madam Justice, you make a political answer to a legal question. I am confident that Bill C-14, as originally drafted and presented in this place, is constitutional. The Liberal government has crafted Bill C-14 legislation to be so restrictive that my own mother would be turned away. We believe that the law is actually contrary to the Carter decision, does not respect the decision of the Supreme Court of Canada, and is unconstitutional. And we have started yet another lawsuit challenging that law. You don't have rights unless you make choices and take responsibility for them. And I think that a good death is our last human right. She would never have known that she would be responsible. Imagine what she'd say now, how oh. she'd feel. Yeah. She's just, uh, she'd just smile right now.
for me, it was a gift. And I, I would ask, people would ask me later and I'd say, I was there for the birth of my children and for the death of my mother and both were equally moving experiences. She'd be very proud of, of where her journey has ultimately taken us all, taken us Canadians.